Welcome Rooted Fellowship, now far and wide. A special welcome to our guests, to those visiting us virtually. Welcome one and all. We're so happy to have you here with us. My name is Tsepo Kotu Rammobo. I have the pleasure of being your host for today. What that means is I will just be helping you navigate through our service. Rooted Fellowship is about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. I'd like to highlight the one which is gospel-centered. This one is my favorite and for the simple reason that what could be better than being about the business of Jesus Christ. Gospel-centered is a life that is centered, saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as our Lord and Savior. Rooted Fellowship is a generous church. We'd like to take this moment to thank those who have given their time, their talents, and their resources. And we, we say that may the Lord bless you for this. We'd like to also appeal to those who do not yet give, that you would prayerfully consider doing so. And should you be interested, that you would go onto our website to find out different ways to do so. We give because we have been given by God. And also, this is an act of worship. Richard Fellowship is about prayer. At this moment, we'd like to move into a time of prayer. A slide will be put up where, you, where different points of prayer um, can be addressed or um, rather you can pray about. Um, you're welcome to pause and pray about different things over and above that what is put before you. Let us pray.
every valley will be lifted high and the weak will be the strong when you come like lightning in the sky how long oh lord how long kings on earth will scatter when they hear thundering sounds of angel songs hearts will tremble filled with holy fear how long Oh Lord, how long? All our hopes are fixed on you That your promises are true And one day you will return All our treasures here will fade So we long to see your face until then our hearts will burn How long, O oh Lord? You will conquer every evil thing Every sorrow, pain, and wrong They will cease with your return, our King How long, O oh Lord, how long? are fixed on you, that your promises are true, and one day you will return. All our treasures here will fade, so we long to see your face, until then our hearts will burn. Your promises are true, and one day you will return. All our treasures here will fade, so we long to see your face. Until then, our hearts will burn. How long?
It is now time for question of the day. What question of the day is when we used to gather together physically in a building, um, a, we would ask a question and break into groups of little threes and fours and come back together, passing the mic around, answering this question. How we will navigate through that digitally is I will ask you a question and you will put your answers down in our comment section. So question of the day is, who would you Zoom or Skype call, be it past, present or future, and explain to them what it is that we're going through currently? So remember, your answers in the comment section. At this point, I'd like to please turn your attention to the preaching of the Word of God. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reino Meyer, and I have the privilege of serving at Rooted Fellowship as a church plant resident. As you know, we are in our new series called How Long, O Lord? This is a cry to God, and we do hope that you feel the urgency of this cry and of this series title in our very cool graphic in the beginning of the worship service. Let, let me remind you of what the series is all about. So Habakkuk is an Old Testament book, and it uh, consists of three chapters. Habakkuk was an Old Testament prophet. He lived in the final decades of Israel's southern kingdom. It was a time of injustice. It was a time of idolatry by God's people. And Habakkuk saw the threat of the mighty nation of Babylon, who at that moment was busy conquering the whole known world. Now, this was approximately 600 years before Christ. Habakkuk was a different kind of prophet. Uh, instead of accusing Israel of their sin, that means speaking to people on behalf of God, he addressed God, speaking to God on behalf of himself and on the behalf of people. Pastor Oney said something really helpful last week. He said Habakkuk is a praying prophet rather than a preaching prophet, which also with my Afrikaans R is quite an uh, 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 example of alliteration. So we are reading someone else's deepest feelings. We are reading someone else's deepest longings, desires, and emotions. Now I have to warn you right from the go that this is quite heavy stuff. We chose this book because the prayers in this book take on the literary form of lament, or we call it lament. And whenever we find lament in the Bible, we find people drawing God's attention to injustice. Now, in a time of a global pandemic, in a time where our news feeds and our news channels light up with stories of injustice, struggle, dishonesty, idolatry, in a time when relationships between people seem kind of tense and we know that everyone is looking for some sort of comfort and meaning, this book gives us language to speak to God. And it also gives us a way to draw close to God and to speak to Him honestly and unfiltered. Let me remind you of this. God can take it when we are honest because He is the creator and the sustainer of everything. Lastly, we chose this book, Habakkuk, because Habakkuk struggles with God's goodness. As Habakkuk lives, and sees all these things happening around him, as described in the book, he asks the following question. Is God good when there is so much evil in the world? Now, that is a legitimate question. You might not be struggling with it at this moment, but it is a well-known question asked by Christians and non-Christians, and one that people particularly struggle with in this time that we are in. Now, Pastor Anne kicked us off like a boss last week. He explained that Habakkuk is about unanswered prayer and faith. He nerded out on the structure of the book and he outlined it as two questions, appeals, complaints or laments from Habakkuk with two responses by God. And that is then followed by a prayer from Habakkuk as a response to God's response in chapter two. He also explained that Habakkuk's name has a significant meaning in the book. And it calls us to cling to, or to embrace, or to hold on to. And he applied that to say that we, in a time like this, embrace 
God. We embrace God through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So what we'll do today is four things. We'll fly over Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 12 to chapter 2 verse 20. Secondly, we will slowly unpack the so-called five woes we find in chapter 2 from verse 6 to 20. Thirdly, we will land with the statement, but the righteous shall live by faith found in chapter 2 verse 4 and then I'll give us a preview of what is to come in the next few weeks. Let us pray. Father God when we pray to you now we realize that we are praying to the same God uh, to which Habakkuk prayed. We realize that we can bring our feelings to you, we can be honest about them and uh, as we speak to you it also leads us to a posture of listening and a posture of waiting for your response. We saw that what you said and how you responded to Habakkuk drew him into a position of faith and of trust in you. And I pray that that would be the same for us this morning, that as we look at your word, as it works in us, that it will, that it will lead us to trust you and uh, to live a righteous life and to leave with you what you um, promised to do in this world that we live in. Some of us might feel disoriented. Some of us might feel really, really tired. Some of us might feel very, very frustrated. And Father God, I'm even aware of people that uh, might just have come onto this video, uh, giving it one last shot to think about faith and believing in you. I pray that you would reveal yourself to us mightily in this time. We are open to listen to you. And may the words of the prophet come alive uh, in our hearts and in our minds this morning. We pray that in your name. Amen. So let's start by flying over Habakkuk 1 uh, verse 12 to chapter 2 verse 20. So chapter 1 verse 12 to 17, that is Habakkuk's response after God told him what is happening and what God himself is busy with. Now Habakkuk is not a happy camper. And for those of you who don't like camping, you know what it's like to not be a happy camper. It's a lame joke, guys. But he's not happy. And here's what he says in a nutshell. He says, Babylon is even worse than Israel. They deified their power. They think of themselves as gods. They treat human beings like animals and they devour the nations. It cannot be that you would use them. And Habakkuk says, this really isn't great news. And after I'm complaining to you, Lord God, I shall stand guard. I shall gaze forward. And I shall wait. And he's actually speaking in quite an interrogative mood. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. It says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. Then God responds. And this is now us flying over chapter 2. He says, okay, write this down. Because this isn't only for you, for now. This will be for others as well. And here's what God says. Here's what he wants Habakkuk to write down. Something is coming. The timing might seem off to you, but it's not. If I let you in on this, you will surely trust me. That's the posture of God as he answers Habakkuk. So listen and write and wait. And then in the rest of chapter 2, God reveals this massive vision to Habakkuk. And he pretty much ends his response with, and I'm paraphrasing here, I am here, you be silent, you wait, watch me. Now before we press on to the five woes, I just want to make a few remarks about verses 1 to 5 in chapter 2. So this second oracle or the second vision of, of Habakkuk must be considered as God's answer to Habakkuk's second complaint about how a holy God can allow a wicked oppressor to continue devouring the righteous. Can I say that again? How a holy God can allow a wicked oppressor to continue devouring the righteous. This is God's answer and we will handle it as such. Other prophets in the Old Testament have been referred to as watchmen. As an example, we have Isaiah, we have Ezekiel, and we have Hosea or Hosea. 
Now, to see a word is an unusual experience for any of us, unless one is a prophet, of course. Now, what Habakkuk saw was a vision in the form of a message that he was to write on tablets. Now, writing on huge wooden tablets for public display in those days was a form of publication. We see that Isaiah did exactly that, and that he was also commanded to write some of his oracles or visions on large tablets. Now, I'm mentioning this because the charge of people have to see and hear this is a biblical charge. It's a biblical command. And this is why we, as the people of God, His church, at this point in 2020, have to speak up when we see injustice, friends. Especially, now listen to this, when the church, God's people, are complicit in these things. We'll double-click this uh, next week. So that's the fly overdone. Let's now slowly unpack the so-called five woes in chapter 2, verse 6 to 2, verse 20. Now, you might have noticed that I'm not reading the whole portion of Scripture today. We just don't have time to do that. But I do want to ask you to start at chapter 1, verse 12, and then finish at 2, verse 20. So this is a series of uh, what is called woe oracles or woe visions. And the form of these visions uh, is a form that is actually quite common in the prophets. So we find five of them between verses 6 and verses 20. Yeah, and here's the structure, loosely. Uh, each vision begins with a description of sin. There's something that is done. Then the second part of each oracle or vision announces the judgment to come on the sinner. So this is what you're doing, and this is what will happen to you. And the third part states the reason for the judgment. And this is why it will happen to you. Now, several questions arise when one begins reading this section. Questions like, who is speaking here? A question like, who is the guilty one against whom the woes are pronounced? Another question is, what is the relationship of this specific section to that which goes before, that we just handled, and uh, that which follows? Now, we might circle back uh, to these things in the coming weeks. But for the purposes of, the, of today's sermon specifically, I won't be addressing these questions. Um, I just want to acknowledge them because it might be questions that you do have and it's questions that come up naturally as we read the Scriptures. But watch this space. We will create one where we can talk about this. What is important to note, I think, for today's sermon is that the person or the nation that is addressed in these woe oracles or visions is guilty of robbery, oppression, check this, this is a big one, and you probably didn't use this word in the last week, debauchery means too much of everything. Debauchery and idolatry. But we are never told his name. We don't know who this person or nation is. This series of woes is designed to show that ultimately sin, evil, crime, greed, Oppression, debauchery, idolatry, they are all doomed to destruction. That's the message of these five woes. Often, people look at the power and structures of evil and become depressed. Is this really God's world? Think about that. Has it gotten away from Him? Does He still have control over the world and its inhabitants? And Habakkuk says, yes. And you'll see it as we go through these woes now. So let's look at them one by one. And I want to ask you, admonish you, encourage you, exhort you to please put on your seatbelt. Fasten your seatbelt. This is going to be a very, very rough ride. It will definitely get in your business. I promise you that. You will definitely feel a strong rebuke. Please don't tune out. Let God's Word work with you. Pastor Honest said this last week as well. We allow the Scriptures to tell us uh, what, what needs to be said. And this is in the Bible, so let's read it and let's work through it. So chapter 2 verse 6 is the first one, and it reads as follows. Woe to him who amasses what is not his. How much longer? And loads himself with goods taken in pledge. So let's just pause there. 
The first woe is the doom of the robber, the thief, the embezzler, the dishonest person, the one who appropriates for himself that which belongs to another. And here's what it says. Such a person may continue in such actions, but sooner or later, like creditors, it's mentioned in this piece of scripture, the oppressed people will rise up against their oppressor and make him pay the last penny. The old man will reap what he sows, is what verse 8 is trying to say to us. So that's the first woe. Let's look at the second one. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house, to place his nest on high, to escape the grasp of disaster. The second woe is the doom of the exploiters, the doom of what is called the extortioners. Now the term to get evil gain in the Christian Standard Bible over here, it's translated as uh, dishonestly makes wealth. That is a term that comes from uh, the art of weaving, or it is a weaver's term. And it literally means to cut off the threads. It is used several times in the Old Testament uh, in the sense of evil gain, or to make one's cut. Now, we still use this expression, actually, in our modern day, to get your cut, to make your cut, or to get one's cut. Definitely in a negative sense in this part of Scripture. So those who get their wealth by illegal methods feel the need for security. That's what this piece of Scripture says. They build their nest on some high secluded spot guarded by every security device available. But the stone in the walls of the house and the wood in the beams will cry out against them. That's what this woe article says. It's gonna end poorly if you exploit or extort. Chapter 2 verse 12, the third woe says, Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. So the third woe is the doom of evil and violence. The tyrant or the evil one builds his society the bulldozer way. He runs over anyone who gets in his way. He gets what he wants by force and by violence. But such a tyrant will not succeed. Because, it says, the Lord of hosts will see to it that social structures built on violence and bloodshed will amount to nothing. Come on, guys. That, that, that preaches just like that on its own. The Lord of hosts will see to it that those structures will amount to nothing. Come on. Verse 13 says, they will be consumed in the flames. Verse 14 says, a kingdom built on the glory of God will cover the whole earth. Let's look at the fourth one. Verse 15 of chapter 2. It says, woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath, and even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. The fourth woe is the doom of having too much. The doom of debauchery. More and more and more and more and more. The guilty ones are those who run their fellow man, excuse me, sorry, who ruin their fellow man by strong drink in order to gaze on their shame. Guys, that's a euphemism that means in order to get them naked and to exploit them. That's what this woe is all about. Strong drink, crime, immorality, they often go together. And unquestionably, you know this, drink and drugs have been the path of doom for many people. Habakkuk says that the one who makes his neighbor drunk will himself drink the cup of the wrath of God. And verse 17 is an interesting one. This is a side note for all the Bible nerds in the house. Verse 17 probably is dated after the Babylonians, this massive nation coming to ruin Israel, 
It's dated probably after the Babylonians came through Lebanon, which is a country just north of Israel, and news uh, got out that they absolutely ravaged all the forests there of cedar wood, and that they also killed massive, massive herds of wild animals. So this is something that happened historically. I wonder if there's an ecological message in this verse for us, to be honest, to take care of God's good creation and not to do with it as we please. Let's look at the last one, verse 19. Woe to him who says to wood, wake up, or to mute stone, come alive. Can it teach? Look, it may be plated with gold and silver, yet there is no breath in it at all. The fifth woe is, of course, the doom of idolatry. Now, guys, follow me here. The prophet asks, what use is? is an idol. The Bible asks us this morning, what use is an idol? It has no power. It is man-made. Idols are instruments of lies and deception, and they will lie to you, and they will deceive you, and they will give you nothing. Many people think that idols are something that they are not. An idol is as silent as the stone out of which it is made. Think about that for a second. It cannot teach. It cannot give us directions. It may look really expensive, but, but it is not alive. It will not answer you if you go to it with the big questions we are currently facing. It will give you nothing. It will leave you empty. And then we see in chapter 2 verse 20 that it ends with this. In contrast to the idol, God, Yahweh, this personal God who has a name, who can be known, he is in his holy temple. That's what verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 20 says. And it says, Let all the earth bow in a hushed silence before him. So all of the forces that oppose God will ultimately be silenced. That is good news, friends. That is good news. I found this great quote uh, in a 1968 commentary. It's a man by the name Gowan. He says, There is a power in the world greater than armies, bombs, bribery, and torture. And it is he who thwarts the efforts of the wicked and gives to the righteous another kind of power to enable them to resist and endure. Isn't that just beautiful? A power that enables us to resist and to endure. Let's land with a statement, but the righteous shall live by faith, which we find in chapter 2, verse 4. God gave Habakkuk one more word of caution. Before he told him the answer to his question of evil in a good world, he said that Habakkuk needed to learn to wait. Habakkuk needed to learn to wait. God's time is not necessarily man's time. Habakkuk wanted his answer immediately. I can understand that because he was a human being and I am one too. And we always fall to this temptation of wanting an answer now. Habakkuk wanted God to punish the Babylonians, to put an end to the evil and oppression right then in that moment. God answers him by saying, I have an appointed time for all of this to happen. And it won't necessarily happen immediately. So, wait. Habakkuk, like all of us, was living between the times. He was living between the promise and the fulfillment. Habakkuk was to wait in faith for God to act. He was definitely assured that judgment on evil would come. He knew that. And he knew that it will not be late. That's what verse 3 in chapter 2 says. But Habakkuk was not to wait with folded hands and bated breath for all this to happen. This is really important for us to note. He was to live a life of faithfulness. Verse 4. 
The evil one is puffed up with pride and he will fall. That's what verse 5 says to us. But the righteous will live by being faithful to his covenant with God. Raymond Calkins describes the response of the church as follows. Now, this is 1947, so it's even more old school language, but it's a ripper of a quote. So let me offer it to you. He says, the summons is from speculation to action, from questioning to conduct, from brooding to duty. God is attending to his business and Habakkuk must attend to his. Running the universe is not his task. That burden belongs to God. But Habakkuk has his task and let him faithfully perform it. Thus, he will live in moral sincerity and in moral security that righteous living brings in the midst of external calamities. That is the way for a righteous man to live in an evil world. 1947. This passage is quoted by the Apostle Paul and it's quoted by the writer of Hebrews in the New Testament in Hebrews 10 verses 37 to 38 as well as in Romans 1 verse 17 as well as in Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. Now remember, these writers that I just mentioned are writers who believed in a doctrine of salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. This meant that only by faith in Jesus, his perfect life on earth, his death that he died, his resurrection from the death, uh, from death, the fact that he ascended to heaven, the fact that he sent his Holy Spirit, the fact that he sits on the right hand of God, and that he will come back to eventually establish a kingdom of peace. Only by believing in that can you be saved. Nothing else. You can only be saved by believing in that. No works, no obedience, no external righteousness, no good deeds that you do can erase the burden that your own sin has placed on you. The writer of Hebrews believed in that. The Apostle Paul absolutely believed in that. I mean, all of his epistles tell us that. Yet, the charge to Habakkuk specifically, to live by God's faithfulness, to live by God's steadfastness, to live by God's trustworthiness is not incompatible with this doctrine. Otherwise, they wouldn't have quoted it, right? So the charge to do something is not incompatible with the doctrine of salvation by faith alone. That's important for us to note. And this means that we as Christians, even though we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone, ought to not to sit back and do nothing. We cannot. We ought to move into action and attend to our business as individuals and as a church. We live between the times, guys. You know that. We live between the cross and the redemption of all things. We have salvation. We have all the promises that comes with being children of God. We know how the story will end and we stand on it. We have seen some of these things break into our lives already. And we know that some of this has not yet happened. As Christians, we have a, a really unique double vision. We have one eye on the things happening now, and we have one eye on the things to come. And our focus is on the things to come. That is where our power and our comfort lies, especially in a time when it feels as if the things happening now are being amplified or getting worse. This isn't me making it up. This is the Apostle Paul. Listen to him in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day, he says. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. That is a ripper and it needs a paraphrase, but not today. Verse 18, so we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So how do we live between the lines? What should we do? How should we respond? Well, if you join us next week, we will riff deeply on this. 
Over the next two weeks, we will discuss all of this in proper depth. We will double-click all the nuggets in the book up until this point, and we will talk about how this applies to us as believers, here and now, in the midst of everything we are facing as a church and as individuals. May I ask that you take this week to reflect on what we know to be true. And what is that? Well, what is said about God in Habakkuk. What is said about a life of sin and the destruction it leads to. What is said about Jesus Christ saving us from eternal condemnation, giving us a new life, living in us, and cheering us on as we run this race faithfully. Do you believe this? Do you really believe this? I would like to encourage you to reflect deeply on this in the coming week until we see each other next week and flesh all of this out. I trust that God will meet you in your reflection. I'm looking forward to the following weeks when we will build on this foundation of truth. I found a little jingle, which is like a really short poem in one of the commentaries I was reading, and I would like to read it to you uh, as, we, as we end our time together. Now the forces of evil still rage. The righteous is still faithful. The battle continues. Let's pray. Father God, we uh, know that the word spoken today is true. We know that this leads to a new life. We know that this leads to a posture of faith and a posture of trust. And we know that it is our business to live faithfully and to live righteous lives. We want to leave your business with you today, Father God, as a church, as, Christ <clears throat> as Christians in this beautiful country of ours, South Africa, and as Christians across the world. We cry out to you. We ask you, how long, O oh Lord? We listen to what you said will happen, and therefore we trust and we resume to live faithfully and uh, righteously. May your Holy Spirit amplify this vision of what is to come in our lives this week. May we hold on to the truth of the gospel because that will not change in this current moment we are living in. And may we, um, may we be open to what you will say to us in the coming weeks and even as we study your word in this week. Uh, as the prophet speaks, may we be open to be uh, rebuked and corrected and made holy, as is the work of your Spirit in our lives. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. to wait on you draw strength from you Lord rest in you Lord rest in you we will abide in you Lord hide in you Lord rest in you Lord rest in just to wait on you draw strength from you Lord rest in 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 
You may connect with us on our different platforms, social media, through Facebook and Instagram. You're welcome to also send your prayer requests either via our app at Go Do Church or through email at community at rootedfellowship.com. Um, what you can also do is join our different groups such as the uh, discipleship groups and city groups. We will now close our service with a benediction which is found in Jude 24 to 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>